Hi there, my name is Jenny Cody and I'm a children's historical fiction author from Atlanta and I am delighted to be with you here today. I had hoped we'd be together in person, but streaming has got to be the next best thing because history must go on. So thank you, Historic uh, St. John's Church, for having me today as part of your author series. I write books for children and adults. My books are geared to 8 to 12 year olds and they are stacked here so you can see they are rather thick, but I am in the middle of a five book saga on the American Revolution. And the first book in that series is The Voice of the Revolution in the Key. And if you can see from the front cover, it's the scene in St. John's of Patrick's Liberty or Death speech. So front cover billing was this speech that I'm here to talk to you about today. I write historical fiction fantasy in that order. And what that means is this, I exhaust all the history that we can possibly know when I'm researching for a book. I ha currently have about 300 titles on the American Revolution that are in my personal library. I have been researching Patrick Henry and the American Revolution for about 12 years. I've been every place that Patrick Henry ever stepped foot. And I've actually been to almost every scene spot of the American Revolution with the exception of a couple of battlefields because I believe that you have to go see where history happened in order to really tell it well and weave the story. And I am passionate about being accurate in my history because the last thing I would ever want to do is get something wrong and make an error because when you make an error in telling the story of history that can perpetuate and 200 years later people think, you know, the British are coming as part of a poem is what was said. And so I want to be crystal clear when I weave this tale of fiction for children. And my goal is to make history fun and make it come alive. This book is about 650 pages. What kid is gonna pick up a biography on Patrick Henry? Mm, zero, but they're gonna follow my talking animals everywhere. So this is where my animals come into play. After I make the rock bed foundation of history as solid as I can make it, I layer on the fiction. And this is where when I bring Patrick Henry to life, I have to know his character so well that when I put words in his mouth that are not recorded, many of which were not, it has to be plausible and true to his character. But then I look for those moments in history where we either don't know how or why something happened, and that's how I slide my animal characters in to tell the story. So today, I'm going to talk to you about a couple of plot lines that I wove into The Voice of the Revolution in the Key, one of which was based in historical truth, and the other was an unexpected plot line that happened while I was writing in St. John's Church. So that's a pretty exciting thing. Now we're gonna do something cool here and kind of interweave my PowerPoint presentation that I normally give with this workshop. And uh, let's see if we can make this happen for you. So every workshop that I do, and I go to schools and homeschool groups around the country and historic groups, and I give a, a workshop or a lecture on my book. And this one is give me liberty or give me another plot line. So let's dive into plot lines, shall we? Well, what is a plot line? A plot line is a storyline in a book, right? And usually there's an overarching plot line of the whole story. For this particular one, The Voice of the Revolution in the Key, it's to help Patrick Henry from a child to find his calling and as the voice of the revolution and to set the stage for the American Revolution. This book starts when Patrick Henry seven, um, and then it goes through the eve of revolution. It ends with liberty or death, March 23rd, 1775. And so it sets up the causes for the American Revolution. So I've got lots of plot lines within one book, but you can weave a plot around a character, one that's real, or one that's fictional, an event, something that happens one time or that repeats, or you can weave a plot around an object, okay? Something that is actual or, or symbolic. Now, I have lots of plots, as you can see in my books here, because I have my talking animals that, that go through time. 
And again, I am here before you today because of my dog and my cat. Max and Liz were the real animals that inspired this whole series when I was watching them play fight. So lots of plots that kind of go through. And one of the most fun things I love to do is to weave a single plot line across several books. And I've done that with this one. So my main character for The Voice of the Revolution in the Tree, the key, of course, is Patrick Henry. So let me ask you, who was Patrick Henry? And so the crickets I'm hearing are probably the same that I would hear in person um, for the most part, because honestly, what people mostly remember about Patrick Henry is what? Seven little words, give me liberty or give me death. And I'll be honest with you, when I rediscovered Mr. Patrick Henry, because I grew up in Virginia and I loved the history and so forth, but as an adult, that's all I could remember too. So I felt a bit ashamed and chagrined as I started to research and study Patrick Henry's life. And let me tell you a little bit more about him briefly. He was a lawyer. He was a delegate to the Virginia House of Burgesses. He was the first and five-time governor of Virginia. And he was known as the voice of the revolution. Now, George Washington was known as the sword of the revolution. Why? Because he led us militarily, right? He was our general. Thomas Jefferson was known as the pen of the revolution. Why? Because he wrote the Declaration of Independence. And Patrick Henry was known as the voice of the revolution because he was the first one that set the ball of the revolution rolling with his spoken word. And he was the first one to speak out against tyranny, against the king, way before anybody ever did, and way before the Sons of Liberty. In fact, he did it in the Parsons' cause before he was even a Burgess, okay, 1763. And then there came his big famous Stamp Act speech in 1765, which really put him on the map and set the ball of the revolution rolling. But he also championed our Bill of Rights. Did you know that we would not have a Bill of Rights if it were not for Patrick Henry? And so many people don't realize that. So when they were trying to ratify the Constitution, Patrick Henry said, uh, wait a minute, there's no Bill of Rights in here. And they said, well, those rights are implied. And Patrick Henry said, look, I know man, I know human, human nature. And if you do not specify and protect these rights, you can kiss them goodbye. Okay, that's my modern day paraphrase. So Patrick Henry did all of these things for our country. But poor Mr. Henry, all we remember are seven little words. Well, if you have not been privileged to attend the reenactment at St. John's of the fabulous Second Virginia Convention, where you get to hear the speech retold, I've made a little effort to go back in time and capture about two minutes, okay, of Patrick Henry in action. So let me show you this little clip of Patrick Henry's speech. Let me set the stage for you. So as you know, things were heating up in Boston, right? British, you know, the, the, the Boston guys, <laughs> Sons of Liberty, were causing lots of trouble. King sent, you know, the Redcoats over, starts to shut it down, shut down the Port of Boston. Redcoats, you know, walking the streets. A um, lot of trouble up there. So all the colonies are watching Massachusetts, right? And the Virginians are like, well, you know what? If that can happen in Boston, that can happen here. And so they said, we got to get together and figure out what we're going to do. So to get out of under the nose of Lord Dunmore, the governor of Virginia, the royal governor, they snuck up to Richmond Town, right? And the only place that would hold everyone, all the Burgesses, was Enrico Parish Church, which is now St. John's. So there they are. Well, half of them are like, well, we got to st still try to, you know, convince the king and parliament, you know, please stop being so mean and hateful. You know, let's work this out, you know. And then half of them are like, you know, you know what? We gotta be ready to arm. It's over. There's no more talk about peace. We gotta be ready. Virginia needs to arm herself. So this debate was raging. And Patrick Henry gets up from his third row pew and he makes this speech and he is railing against and he's calling everybody to attention of what is at stake here. So let's listen in on the last couple of minutes of Liberty or Death. Listen. Besides, sir, we shall not fight our battles alone. There is a just God who presides over the destinies of nations, who will raise up friends to fight our battles for us. 
The battle, sir, is not to the strong alone. It is to the vigilant, the active, the brave. Besides, sirs, we have no election. Should we be base enough to desire it, it is now already too late to retire from the contest. There is no retreat but in submission and slavery. Our chains are forged, their clanking may be heard upon the plains of Boston. The war is inevitable. And let it come. Yeah. I repeat it, sir. Let oh. it come. Mr. Henry, please speak for peace, sir. For it peace. is in vain to extenuate the matter. Gentlemen may cry, peace, peace. But there is no peace. The war is actually begun. The next gale that blows from the north shall bring to our ears the clash of resounding arms. Our brethren are already in the field. Why stand we here idle? What is it that they wish? What would they have? Is life so dear? Or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery, forbid it, almighty God! I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death! So those seven little words rallied a nation to independence, and that means they're very important. So when I was getting ready to write this, I had to come up with why and how Patrick Henry came up with those seven little words. Where did they come from? Did he think of them on the spot? And as I started researching, I'm like, wait a minute. They weren't original to Patrick Henry. Well, if, if Patrick Henry didn't come up with them first, who said them first? Well, that enters the first plot line, liberty or death, who said it first? Well, could it be this guy, Joseph Addison? Ever heard of him? I'll show you a picture of him here on this slide. This guy had some hair, okay? The 80s had nothing on this guy, <laughs> Joseph Addison. So he was a playwright in London. And in 1712, he wrote a play called Cato, and it was based on the events of Cato the Younger in ancient Rome. And the theme was liberty versus tyranny. And this play was wildly popular in England, and it was wildly popular in the colonies. And in fact, it was George Washington's favorite play. So let me give you a couple of examples of how crazy popular this was. Nathan Hale, ever heard of this guy? He was our first spy. He only lasted nine days and the British caught him. But right before he was hung and strung up as a spy, he quoted these words. I regret that I have but one life to lose for my country. Okay, do you think he just waxed poetic on the spot? No, he was quoting Cato. Act four, scene four, what a pity it is that we can die but once to serve our country. Okay, so he knew his Cato. Let's see about George Washington. He said this. It is not in the power of any man to command success, but you have done more. You have deserved it. He said that in praise of Benedict Arnold. Ooh, there's a plot line for you, but that's coming up in the next book. So let's see, did he come up with this? Well, from Cato. Act one, scene two. Tis not in mortals to command success, but we'll do more, Sempronius, we'll deserve it. You won't believe this, but plays were actually banned by Congress. Look, we couldn't afford gunpowder, clothing, tents, food, supplies. And so Congress was like, look, we're not going to spend money on frivolous things like entertainment and plays. 
But in the harsh winter at Valley Forge, George Washington knew his men needed a shot in the arm. He, he knew they needed to remember why they were fighting. And so he had the play Cato performed at Valley Forge. And it was really the first USO event that happened. And Martha Washington helped with it. And George Washington was censured by Congress for that. But he knew, he didn't care. He was such a rebel. And, he, and it was a shot in the arm. So this play Cato was powerful in the dynamic of these founding fathers. All right, so let's get back to Patrick Henry. Give me liberty or give me death, he exclaimed. What do you think? Yeah, he was quoting Cato. Act two, scene four. It is not now time to talk of all but chains or conquest, liberty or death. Patrick Henry had this un unusual ability to press people's buttons. Do you have anybody that can press your buttons? Okay. He knew how to trigger emotion and thought, and he knew that every man sitting at that second Virginia convention that day, when he got up to speak, he knew they knew their Cato. And so he put them in the shoes of the actors there with this play. And beyond that, in the shoes of these ancient Romans, where Cato was the last citizen of the Roman Republic. And he said, look, you have got to fight for this liberty. You're getting ready to lose it to a tyrant. Hmm. Patrick Henry called the king a tyrant too. History never repeats itself, does it? Hmm. So Patrick Henry knew what he was doing that day when he was putting everybody into Cato. So liberty or death? was not original to Patrick Henry. We know that it came from Joseph Addison, the play. So where did Joseph Addison get it? Did he make it up? How did he even know about Cato? Well, ever heard of this guy named Plutarch? He was a writer in the first century AD. And I have a slide to show you Plutarch's lives. And there's a picture of him. Oh, look, he wrote his little hands off. I know how he feels <laughs> sometimes. But Plutarch developed a new genre of books called biographies. And he wrote a series of books, Plutarch's Lives, Parallel Lives, about Greek and Roman heroes and villains of history, if you will, showing their character and what happened in history. So that's how we know a lot about the history of Cleopatra, Alexander the Great, so many. The Founding Fathers read their Plutarch. They studied the ancients. They understood how man and governments had worked all along. Plutarch was Benjamin Franklin's favorite book as an 11-year-old. Have you ever read Plutarch? I encourage you, go check it out. You will be amazed at the intellect of our founding fathers and what kind of stuff they read, okay? So, Plutarch wrote about Cato. That's how Joseph Addison knew about him, okay? So, who was Cato anyway? Well. I'll show you this slide. This is the only picture I could find. I think it was his Facebook picture. <laughs> Not really. But I got back in my time machine just because I, I'm so committed to the cause. And I got a snippet of video from the Roman Senate. Now, I've got to warn you, this is shocking footage because we in our day and age, our modern civilized society politically would never resort to this kind of behavior of screaming and yelling. Of course we wouldn't. So take a look at this and take a look at Cato in action and see if he reminds you of anyone. Take a look at this. Cato, the Senate, he has you. Pompey Magnus, I have a question concerning your friend and co-consul, the darling of Venus, Gaius Julius Caesar. Why does his chair remain empty? Why does he not come home? His illegal war is over. Gaul is long since on its knees. Why does Caesar keep his brave soldiers from their families and friends? For eight long years, he has gorged himself like a wolf on the blood of Gaul and thereby made himself monstrously rich. Why? Why does he ply the mob with races and fights? and gaudy feasts? Why has he paid the debts of every reprobate fool in this Senate House? Why? I'll tell you why he does these things. He wants to buy himself a crown. He wants to destroy the Republic and rule Rome 
as a bloody tyrant. That's right. Therefore, I move that Caesar's governorship in Gaul be terminated immediately, that his armies be disbanded, and that he be recalled to Rome to answer charges of illegal warfare, theft, bribery, and treason. So, Julius Caesar did not like Cato speaking out against him. Uh, he was not a fan. And so, when I was researching in Rome, and here is a slide I'll show you, that's my son and I. I'm throwing this in for free. That's Julius Caesar's tomb. And you know they're still putting flowers on his tomb here 2,000 years later, and I hope someone does that for me. But um, when I was researching in Rome, and this is a slide of me in the Roman Colosseum, and you'll notice what's on the cover of my sixth book, the one right before The Voice. It's the Roman Colosseum. Hmm. What am I doing in Rome? And what would I need to make sure happens in this book in order for Patrick Henry to eventually say, give me liberty or give me death? Give that a thought for a minute and we'll come back to that. So, because I'm so committed to the cause, I, I had, I went to Rome, but I had to go to Paris too. It's for the children. It works every time. So I went to the Louvre, hunting Cato, and there was a statue there that I was looking for. And believe it or not, the docents there at the Louvre didn't know where it was at first. I had to find it and show them where it was. But I want you to, sh to look at a little bit of video footage of what I discovered and why Cato was so important. Take a look at this. Hi, I'm at the Louvre Museum in Paris, and I have been searching everywhere for this statue. This is Cato the younger. And the significance of the statue is this. When Patrick Henry said, give me liberty, give me death, those words were taken from a play written by Joseph Addison um, in the early 1700s about Cato the younger. And it was a story of this Roman who uh, was making a last stand against Julius Caesar and trying to hang on to the Republic. And he essentially kind of said those words as far as um, liberty or death or the idea of it and so he committed suicide rather than you know with, with his sword rather than um, be enslaved and not have his freedom to a tyrant I'm paraphrasing but anyway you get the general idea but I've been looking everywhere for this statue when Cato died they made a statue of him that was placed where he's buried and this actually is not the statue, but this was a rendition in the 1800s of what that may have been. So I'm going to give it to There we go. And there is his broken sword. I'll take you around. There he is. There is Kato of Utica. And the sculpture is done by Jean-Baptiste Roman. Okay. And this was done in 1832. So now you know it all started with Kento. So I have one plot line four characters and two books that this goes through. We started with Patrick Henry's Liberty or Death speech, right? We know it didn't come from him. So then where did it come from? Joseph Addison. So if Joseph Addison doesn't write Cato, Patrick Henry will never say, give me liberty or give me death. If Joseph Addison never reads his Plutarch, he'll never know about Cato to write about. And if we don't know about Cato, liberty or death will never happen. So in book six, in this slide, The Fire of the Revelation and the Fall, I had to make sure that Plutarch included Cato in his book. Well, gee, who could make sure of all the lives he had to choose from to write about that he would include Cato the Younger? Well, possibly a brilliant French cat that loves to sit on the desks of writers and encourage their pen. I, you'll have to read it to find out. But anyway, so Cato, Plutarch, Addison, Patrick Henry, 
So that's how it all started in ancient Rome. Patrick Henry said, give me liberty or give me death, because it started in ancient Rome. So let me tell you another plot line that I was not expecting. And it happened while I was getting ready to write this scene. Well, this outline for the voice of the revolution in the key and the declaration of the sword and the spy, which is the new novel that's out now. It just came out. Um, the outline just took me six months. I know <laughs> it's out of control because it, it just, I take a long time to make sure that I get the history really captured every little detail. So this was already going to be a long series of books. But then sometimes unexpected plot lines just happen. And sometimes you have characters that invade your outline. And this happened to me with Cato, the bald eagle. Well, in uh, 2016, I was writing the Liberty or Death scene, getting ready to. And I got the nudge, you know what? I need to get up to Richmond and sit in St. John's Church on the day it happened in the room where it happened and write Liberty or Death. So I contacted St. John's and I said, hey, would you all allow me, permit me to sit in the church and write the scene on the day? And they said, sure. They were so gracious to do that. And so this was, it's always an amazing thing when I can write on site. It really emotes um, a lot of the, uh, the emotion that happened when I was in, in my fourth book, I actually flew to London and I sat in Handel's composing room to write the scene of him writing Messiah in the room where it happened, and that was crazy. So um, I drive up to Williamsburg, where I usually stay when I come up here, and as I was crossing over the James River uh, on the ferry, which I love to do, a bald eagle came and circled my car, and I'm like, oh, Cato, my character. You're here to greet me. Are you trying to stay in my book? Because what was happening was this baby bald eagle invaded my outline. I wasn't planning on this. This character, Patrick Henry, helps him learn to fly when he's a kid. But it was taking four chapters I had not banked on. So my outline was growing and I'm like, oh, maybe I need to erase this eagle. Maybe I just need to cut it, you know, not have him in the book. And so I was debating this when I came up here to write Liberty or Death. So I see this eagle greet me over my car. I'm like, oh, wow, that's so cool. I cross the, the ferry all the time when I come up from Atlanta a few times a year, and I see osprey all the time, but, and I know bald eagles are there, but I had never seen one, so that's one. That night, I have a dream, and in my dream, a bald eagle builds a nest over my door. But it wasn't the door to my house. I couldn't quite place it, but I knew it was mine somehow, so that's two. So the next morning, I get up, and I go drive to Richmond as I'm getting on the interstate to drive up there to Richmond, another bald eagle comes and circles my car. That's three. I'm like, ooh, Cato really wants to stay in this book. So I get there and show some uh, scenes with you. My dear friend Ray Bear, he was there walking me around and I'm acting out liberty or death and, you know, kind of acting out the scene before I get ready to write it. And, um, we go outside and we go through that original door that's there. And he said, now this is the door that Patrick Henry and George Washington and Thomas Jefferson would have walked through. And I turned and I looked and that was the door from my dream. And I was like, oh wow, that's the door where the eagle's nest was. I didn't tell Ray any of this. I was just keeping all this eagle stuff in my head. And I'm like, something's happening here. Well, I proceed to have the honor to sit where Patrick Henry sat, not the actual chair but in, in the place where he would have, have, have sat. And I wrote this scene and the emotion and the feeling and the, the imagery just came alive. And Cato becomes a huge part of the scene. So he's soaring past the window of St. John's Church at the crucial moment where Patrick Henry needs to find the words. And he's screeching, liberty, liberty, liberty. And Patrick Henry hears this bald eagle screeching. And he thinks of Cato from his youth. And he's like, Cato, that's what he had named his eagle. And then everything pop, 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 liberty or death. And he spills it out, give me liberty or give me death. And Cato soars triumphantly and he lands on the top of the steeple. And the ideas all come together. And Cato ends up being the glue to the entire book. So this unexpected plot line with this bald eagle comes together. So I'm like, oh, Cato, forgive me for ever thinking that you couldn't be part of this book. 
So I'm wrapping it up, just elated with the scene of how well it came together. And Ray walks in and he says, Jenny, you gotta wrap it up now because we're getting ready to have the reenactment of the Second Virginia Convention. And I'm like, okay, I'm done. I was like, it was wonderful. And then I noticed this carved chair sitting on the front of the, of the, uh, of, of the church up there by the pulpit. And I thought, Ray, where did that chair come from? It was really old. He said, I don't know where it came from. He said, we just use it for the reenactment. And as I stared at it, it had a bald eagle carved into it. I said, wow, what has a bald eagle carved into it? He said, oh, yes. He says, oh, by the way, five minutes ago, a bald eagle came and circled the church and landed on the steeple. And I've been here eight years, and that's the second time I've ever seen an eagle. But this was happening while I was writing the scene of Cato, the fictional fantasy bald eagle, circling the church and landing on the steeple. So I ask you, what is fiction? What is fantasy? And what is reality? This day, this unexpected plot line came together in real life. So sometimes the unexpected happens and it is marvelous. Well, I hope that's given you some insight and some things maybe you did not know about liberty or death. And I'm going to be happy to chat with you in a little bit. Um, but for now, I'd like to show you the trailer of the book for The Voice of the Revolution in the Key. And then I'll see you later and we'll have a chat about liberty or death.